nation, and uh, thank you guys for joining in. We're in 1 Corinthians 15 right now, but uh, we, were take, we were taking a look at it last week, and um, we were uh, just kind of laying out what condemnation is and the impact that it has um, on our lives, and we were looking at some of the roots of it, and uh, you know, when the, when the fall of man took place, condemnation went everywhere, and uh, we've been, mankind has abiding under condemnation for several thousand years now. When, uh, when Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, man's conscience became awake and man had the opportunity to now perceive good and evil. And then man immediately considered himself to be evil and uh, considered God to be evil. And as a result of that, hid from God's presence and um, caused himself to step out of relationship with God. And so um, condemnation was addressed under the old covenant um, in the sense that, uh, you know, it was the law pointed out the sin of man, but then the uh, temple sacrifices covered sin and allowed man to enjoy some degree of forgiveness, but it was not an eternal forgiveness, and that did not happen until Jesus came. And so when Jesus came, he brought forth an eternal forgiveness. He brought forth um, the opportunity for man to live in a state of no condemnation. And so this is what Jesus provides for us, and what we want to do is we want to remove the root. We looked at it last week, um, of removing the root of condemnation out of our lives. And if we have that image, if you guys can get that on the screen whenever you get a chance. Um, but that root of condemnation is just that, that sense of thinking that God is against you, or God is mad at you, or God is holding your sin against you. And um, it's a very destructive thing because you live your life in a state of guilt. You live your life in a state of feeling like that you don't measure up. And uh, God doesn't want you living like that. He doesn't want to live you in a state of that. And we looked at this last week. Um, and that we're going to probably continue to look at this while we are on this series. But um, a lot of times what we do is we look at the fruits of, why, of what is wrong, whether that be physical sickness or financial lack or marriages messed up or relationships messed up. And we just address um, the fruits of what's going on, but we don't address the root. And so, and what we talked about last week is psychology has the ability to take a look at you know, the fact that stress is extremely... Um, uh, destructive, and we can, we can see that. And people do things to try to alleviate stress and get free from stress, and they'll try to, you know, maybe get a massage or maybe um, try to do aromatherapy or try to take time off from work and have a vacation. And anything they can do to alleviate stress, we have a very stressful world. Stress can impact everything. But under stress, there's a deeper root, and it's fear. I mean, you know, fear is very destructive. And if you live your life in a state of fear, um, it's going to rob you of peace. It's going to rob you of joy. It's also going to rob you of the opportunity for love to flow through you. And um, because it's difficult to be fearful and loving at the same time. Fear and love don't occupy the same place. But what we see through Scripture, uh, you know, and, and psychologists can recognize stress. They can recognize fear. They can even recognize guilt. And, uh, and we, you know, we see people operating in guilt. And as a result of that guilt, they don't know how to get rid of it. And they have all of these destructive habits that will arise, and they can go that deep, but the deepest root is condemnation. And only, only, that can only be addressed by God. Condemnation can only be addressed by God. Psychology does not have the opportunity to address that. They can address fear, they can address stress, they can even address guilt to some degree, and they can you know, try to talk to people about self-love and things of that nature. But there's a deeper root that has been plaguing all of mankind, and it's called condemnation, took place at the fall of man. And so we found out that Jesus actually laid the axe to that root and cut condemnation out. How many know there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus? That is an absolute reality. That's, that's what you and I enjoy as a forgiven child of God. We don't have to live in a state of, of believing that we're condemned any longer. But what we, what we looked at last time we were together, how many know the enemy is the accuser of the brethren? The Bible says that we are not to be ignorant of his devices and uh, one of the primary things that he tries to do is try to bring accusation into your heart and into your life uh, to make you feel as though God is mad at you or against you or you don't measure up and you're not good enough. So how many know that just because, G how many know Jesus defeated the devil 2,000 years ago? This 2,000-year-old victory, condemnation, the root has been destroyed. Um, there is therefore now no condemnation those who are in Christ. But how many know the enemy is a liar? And he's going to try to lie and he's going to try to bring accusation. And so... Our part is to get our hearts established in righteousness. Our part 
is to believe correctly so that we can remove the lie of condemnation. How many know that even though something's a lie, if you believe it, it, it gives that lie power over your life? You ever met someone who just believed that they were ugly, but they weren't ugly at all, but they believed that they were? And if they believed that, then that's what they experienced, even though it was a lie, even though it was not true. And so what God does through Scripture and through the Word and through truth is truth brings liberty, truth brings freedom. And what we want to do is we want to, if this is the primary attack of the enemy, to bring condemnation and to try to, as a result, bring fear and guilt and stress and then produce bad fruit on our tree, we want to, with the truth of God's Word, come against the condemnation, attack it, and remove that root so that we don't have to live like that, we don't have to deal like that. You know, and last week we took a look at how I was talking about I had that tree in the back of my yard that was growing, and as long as I was just cutting the branches off, it was never being removed, and it would come back, and it would mess up the fence line. But when I made a decision to go out there and remove that root, that is when um, it, it changed, and I didn't have to deal with it any longer. And so during this time in this series, we want to aggressively attack the root of condemnation and endeavor to remove it out of our lives. And what I shared last week um, also was just talking about the, the degree of, of, of condemnation in my life personally, where it produced in me a sense of depression. And, uh, you know, depression is, is a very, it's an awful thing. It's the, probably the greatest battle I've ever had in my life was against depression. It was greater than drug addiction, greater than alcoholism, um, greater than all the other things I faced was that root of depression. And um, I did not get free from depression until I rec recognized that I was not condemned and that I was loved and my heart began to get established in righteousness. And so I don't take away the medical aspects of, of people that deal with depression. And, and I had definitely had a period of my life when I was, when I was um, you know, taking medication and things of that nature. And I don't want to belittle anyone who's dealing with those things and is taking medication. How many you know God uses all forms of deliverance? God's not anti-medical community. God is for the medical community. But at the end of the day, what I want to show you is a lot of these problems that we deal with, depression, addiction, uh, the dominion of sin, they all have a root, and that root is condemnation. And if we will go after that root and endeavor to remove it out of our lives, it's going to change the fruit that's on our tree. And so for me, as I begin to find out that I was the righteousness of God, and I allowed that righteousness to be established in my life, I got so free from depression that I forgot that I was ever depressed. And God had to remind me that it was something that I dealt with. But there was a time in my life where that depression brought me to the point of, of suicidal thoughts. I mean, I was ready to take my life. And how many know that just because you're saved doesn't mean that you are exempt from the enemy trying to bring you into a state of depression? It's really important to understand that. Enemy, he's, he's, he doesn't fight fair and he's going to attack. And so... Um, the enemy tries to bring in that condemnation. And so when that condemnation is present, if it's not handled properly, it's going to be handled one of two ways, depending upon your personality. If condemnation is inside of you and you're dealing with it and you're believing the lie that God is against you and your sin has not been paid for on the cross and you're believing that God is against you, um, it's, going to, it's going to exhibit out of your life in one of two ways. The, the one way is it will exhibit is that you will condemn yourself. You will judge yourself and you will condemn yourself. And so what that does is when you have that type of personality and that's the way you're handling condemnation, as you condemn yourself, it will rob you of happiness. It will rob you of joy. It will bring you into a state of oppression. And if you stay long enough in oppression, it will eventually lead to depression. And you're living in a state of condemning yourself because you believe that God is against you or you're not good enough. And that's not a happy place to be. And there's horrible fruit that's on that tree. But how many know that even though someone believes that, the reality is, how many know Jesus took care of all of our sin on the cross and there's no condemnation for us? Amen? Or, depending upon your personality type, some people don't internalize condemnation. What they do is they externalize it and they release it as a pointed finger. You guys ever been around mean religious people? Mean religious people go around judging and condemning everybody else. Because they don't know how to handle condemnation and they're not internalizing it, they externalize it. And what ends up happening is rather than lending a helping hand to people in the world, they, they extend a pointed finger and they pick apart and accuse and condemn the people around them. Why? 
Once again, that condemnation, that sentence of death, is exhibiting itself in a very... Un- the Bible, condemnation kills. It's destructive. And so what happens is these people, they don't know that God loves them. They don't know that they're forgiven. And so they are out condemning everybody. You ever get around Christians like that? I mean, it will mess up evangelism. You can be, you can be witnessing to somebody. You can be loving on somebody. And here comes this angry, condemning Christian. And how many know the message that we have to the world is not to call their sin to remembrance? The message that we have to the world is a message of forgiveness and love. Now, how many know right's still right and wrong's still wrong? But how many know Jesus paid for all of that on the cross? And so when I'm sharing the, the message of the gospel with somebody, I'm not there to point a finger at them and condemn them. I'm actually there to point them to Jesus and lend a helping hand to them and say, God will help you out of your sin. God will help you out of your situation. But God loves you just the way you are. And when that religious, self-righteous condemnation is present, it really affects the kingdom of God. And what it does is it presents a picture of an angry, fault-finding father, which is not true. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. The reality is is that Jesus did such a good job on the cross that He's removed this root of condemnation, and whosoever will may come into this ark, into this new covenant, into this Savior, and live a life where condemnation does not dominate their lives. And so when an individual doesn't know how to handle condemnation, they'll either internalize it and condemn themselves, or they'll externalize it and condemn everybody else. But how many know the the true thing that we should do is look at Jesus and see what Jesus did on the cross? How many of y'all think Jesus did a good job? If He did a great job, then that means all sin's been taken care of, past, present, and future. It's been condemned in His body on the cross, and it's been annihilated. When He said it was finished, it really was, and the the ending to condemnation took place 2,000 years ago. Now, if you've not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says you will abide under condemnation because you have not received this Savior. But this condemnation is not coming from the heart of God. This condemnation is coming from the fall of man. And so what we want to do is we don't want to be those that are condemning ourselves and living in sickness and depression and all of those things. We don't want to be those that are condemning other people and extending the pointed finger. We want to be those that honor Jesus. That honor the work of the cross. Recognize we're forgiven. Enjoy that gift of no condemnation. And then as a result of that, we can drink in the love of God and we extend a helping hand to those around us And also, we don't take a pointed finger and condemn ourselves. Do you know there's nothing holy about condemning yourself? There's nothing righteous about condemning yourself. There's nothing, because it's self righteous for you to think that you can pay for your own sin. And I know that's a, that's a deep statement, but it's self-righteous for you to think that you can pay for your own sin. I mean, you know, there are those that deal with guilt and condemnation so much that they feel the need to cut themselves. Yeah, it's rampant in the youth, man. It's, 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 it's everywhere. And what, what's going on? Well, they feel awful. They feel bad. And they want to feel... So, and, or they may feel numb. And they want to feel something. And so as a result of that, they, they, they cut themselves. But how many know that that's the enemy taking an accusation and a perversion and robbing them of the reality that they're beautiful and they're lovely and they're awesome and they are a a child of God, and they're invited into the family, I mean, no, they don't have to punish themselves for their own guilt. You know, and and for me, you know, I didn't cut, but man, I I walked down a road of tremendous self-destruction. You know, drug addiction and alcoholism and sexual addiction, and, and I walked down, I tried hard to kill myself. Why? I hated myself. I hated the person that I'd become, and all of that guilt and condemnation produced in me a sense of self-destruction. And even after I was saved, even after I was a Christian, I still carried that sense of of unworthiness and condemnation. And it would take the Gospel to root that root out of me to where I could begin to not accuse myself, but actually love myself. See, the enemy, not only does he try to accuse you, but how many know he wants you to accuse you? That's what he wants. He wants you condemning you. He wants you attacking you. Because if he can get you taking his accusation and giving it voice in the first person, how many know you can rip yourself to pieces? 
And it's not healthy. How many know that you know, uh, cancer is when the body attacks itself? Well, condemnation is when your conscience is in agreement with the enemy. Not in agreement with God. And you, with, through the, you begin to attack and tear yourself apart because you don't feel like you're worthy. Now here's the reality. How many know there's nobody in this room that in and of themselves are worthy? There's nobody in this room that's been perfect. There's nobody in this room that's been good enough. How many know we all equally need Jesus? But if Jesus did a good job on the cross, then that means I have no right to punish myself for sin any longer. Can I get an amen? I mean, I mean, there's a good portion of uh, during the dark ages where these monks would they would they would take these whips and they would beat themselves to try to to give penance for their sin, and they would crawl upstairs the glass on it trying to give penance for their sin. It's foolish for a man to think he can pay for his own sin. I mean, no, you can't pay for your sin. It's too expensive, okay? You don't have the ability to pay for it. You don't have enough righteousness to cover it. I mean, no, Jesus paid for it. He paid for all of it. So now, we, we don't add anything to that. We just simply believe what He did on the cross, and we allow the beauty of that love to wash over us and remove every condemnation out of our hearts towards ourselves and towards other people. You know, when your heart is filled with condemnation, how many know you can be hard on yourself? Let me take it a step further. How many know when your heart is filled with condemnation, you can be really hard on the people around you? How many know when you feel condemned, you can, you, really you're mad at yourself, but you take it out on the people around you? Condemnation will destroy relationships. Because you feel bad about yourself, take it out on your spouse, take it out on your kids, take it out on your friends. And really the reason you're attacking people is because you're attacking yourself. And what God wants to do is He wants to remove that root of condemnation out of our lives to give us freedom to let us understand that we're loved and we're forgiven. Amen? And you know, and I talk about this a lot, but, but you see it when people first get saved. When people first get saved. I mean, remember when you first got saved? Your heart was filled with peace, filled with joy, filled with love. You're floating through life. Why? You had a period of time where condemnation was not owning you because you actually believed you were forgiven. And as a result of that, you were connected to the vine and you were bringing forth amazing fruit. And how many know that you're just as forgiven now as the day that you were born again? How many know you don't have the ability to wear out the blood of Jesus? You don't have the ability to wear out the cross. How many know you're just as forgiven? But what happens a lot of times is we end up ingesting the lies of the enemy and we start weighing ourselves in the balances of our good and bad conduct, and we start taking on all this heavy weight upon ourselves, feeling as though we're not forgiven. And when we do that, we're actually committing New Testament disobedience. We're not, we don't have the obedience of faith. We don't believe the cross was enough. And then we embrace the lie of condemnation. And when we do that, we dishonor the work of the cross, and we begin to attack ourselves and attack those around us. And God wants to remove that root. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, 56, uh, it, it says the, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. <clears throat> and so the law is the law is there to condemn. Talking about the law of Moses. Not talking about the, the New Testament law of faith and love and liberty that God writes on our hearts. I'm talking about that old covenant. The purpose of the old covenant was to condemn. And so where you see condemnation present, you will see strength and power says the strength of sin is the law. And so, so, so many times what will happen is, how many know, you know we had a bonfire out here you know, a few weeks ago, and if I went out to that bonfire and I tried to put that bonfire out by dashing it with gasoline, how many know I'm going to be ineffective? And so many times people will find someone who's wrapped up in sin. Let's say someone's addicted to pornography and they, and they can't stop. And they, and, they, and they want to stop, but they can't stop, and so they keep doing it over and over again and they don't know how to stop. Not sure what that sound is. But um where is it at right here? Don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Anyway. So they're trying, they're they're wrapped up in bondage to this sin. So how many know that, that God wants to set you free from the dominion of sin? God does not want sin to own you. God does not want sin to rule you. Now, how many know that a Christian can be in bondage to something, but how many know just because they're in bondage to something doesn't mean it's going to change their nature? How many know you can still be born again and struggle with something? 
Man, can I get an amen this morning? Yeah. Praise God, y'all are so silent today. It's all good, though. Um, and so we got someone who's wrapped up in, in pornography. They're wrapped up into to this addiction. Now, how many know that if I come to this person and I condemn them, I'm actually going to empower them to fail? Why? Because the strength of sin is the law. I come up to them and say, look, you know, you need to quit that. You need to stop that. You're dirty. You're no good. This is awful. I can't believe that you would do this and just condemn them and condemn them and condemn them. I don't know. We've never had this happen with this mic before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seems like it's like, okay. Okay, anyway. It, how many you know if we go after them and we attack them? Now, how many you know a lot of times you can think that you're going to help this person? You can think that you're doing this person good. But if I go after them and I attack them and I judge them and I condemn them, what's going to happen is it's going to strengthen sin in them. Now, they may stop doing it to where I'm aware of it, but what happens a lot of times is where that condemnation is present, they'll take that sin and they'll hide it and do it. And then they don't feel comfortable talking about it. They don't feel comfortable opening up about it. And rather than me helping them and being on their team, they take that battle and they fight it alone. And they fight it by themselves. And they're under that heavy yoke of condemnation. They think, I'm against them, and I'm mad at them, and I think that they're bad. They think that God is against them, God's mad at them, and God thinks that they're bad. And the whole time, the strength of sin is being amplified by the condemnation of the law. And so you never want to, where condemnation is present, sin will reign. Where condemnation is present, sin will have dominion. And so, I don't want to take gasoline and put it on the fire of their sin. You know what I want to do? I want to come to them. I want to make sure they know this. Number one, God loves them. I love them. And we are for them. And then, begin to confirm in them their identity. How many know God's never created anyone to be addicted to pornography? And you know, that's not God's plan for somebody's life. God's not created someone to be addicted to alcohol or addicted to sin or addicted to lying or addicted to stealing. God, that's not God's plan. So what I need to do is I need to let them know you are a child of God. Strengthen them with that reality. Strengthen them with the love of God. Let them know all your sin has been paid for in the body of Jesus Christ on the cross. You are forgiven. And see, the, the, the natural mind says, my goodness, you're giving that person a license to sin. Sweetheart, if you preach the cross to someone who's involved in sin, it actually removes that condemnation out from under them, removes that dominion of sin, and their heart gets filled with gratitude because they are so thankful that they're forgiven, and it gets harder to sin against love than it is to sin against anger and condemnation. How many of you know Jesus says, He that is forgiven of much, the same loves much. God wants this person to understand, I see you struggling. I see what you're dealing with. And I want you to know I love you the same. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm going to crawl down in the ditch with you. And I'm going to remind you, you weren't born for this. You're better than this. You know, when, when, when the uh, prodigal son ended up in the pig pen, and he came home because he was hungry. How many know the father never condemned the child? The father saw value in the child. The father wanted to remind the child of who he really was. What did he do? He said, bring, bring forth the ring. Bring forth the robe. Bring forth the shoes. Let me re- You've simply forgotten who you are. Let me remind you who you are. You're better than this pig slop. You're better than this pornography. You're better than this addiction to sin. And I believe in you. Even though you're going through this, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. And it's that type of administration that removes condemnation. And as a result, it removes the power of sin. You know, they're, they're dealing with a lot of um, challenges with these wildfires that are, you know, are ravaging California. And you know they've been experimenting with one of, one of these... These one of the ways to put these fires out, and they're like these, um, these, th- these. I guess they're like an almost like an explosive, and they just cover uh, the area in like a flower-like substance. And I mean, you know, if you can remove oxygen, you'll stop a fire. 
You know, if you take a candle and you, and you, and you put like a little card on top of it and you let that candle and, and you let that candle burn up all the oxygen in there, how many of the flame will go? It'll go out, right? Here's the thing. If you can remove condemnation out of a sinner's life, they'll stop sinning. But you have to have enough faith in the cross and the work of Jesus to preach forgiveness to someone who's wrapped up in sin. I mean, you know, logically, the logical mind and the carnal mind and, and really much of the mind of the Christian community is I just need to tell them what, what they're doing is wrong and they need to stop doing it and I just need to come after them with that. And I need to throw more rules and regulations and laws against them and punishments against them. And if I do that, then they'll stop sinning. No, they won't. They'll hide. And they'll keep sinning and they'll do it alone. They need, and that's why the Bible says confess your sins to one another. Why? You need to invite somebody into your place of sin. <laughs> I mean, you know, and that's why the Bible says to confess your sin to one another. Why does it say that? Because you need somebody to come see your stench, to see your ugly, and say, I love you, and I'm not leaving you. And when that happens, you dismiss the shame of that sin. And it's you and this person and God together against the sin, rather than this individual living alone, walking alone. And what happens is under that condemnation, and when it's there, how I many you know people develop a mask? They get really good at hiding who they really are. And they'll pretend that they're awesome around you, but inwardly they're still struggling with this sin. They're still struggling with this condemnation. And they're dealing with something called hypocrisy. How I many you know man made religion always breeds hypocrisy? I'm, I'm going to have a nice shiny mask and I can point out at church and when I'm around other Christians. But inwardly, I'm alone. And if anybody saw what I was really like, nobody would like me and nobody would want to be around me and nobody would love me. So I'm going to make my mask big and I'm going to make my mask tall and I'm going to make my mask shiny and I'm going to hide behind that mask. But inwardly, I'm full of dead man's bones because I'm dying. Because nobody know, people knew who I really was, no one would love me. And that's why there's power in finding someone that you can trust. There's power in confessing your sin to one another because what you're doing is you're inviting someone into the darkness and you're saying, you know what, I'm struggling with this. And how many know if you're going to invite somebody in, you need to be someone you can trust. It needs to be someone who believes the best about you. It needs to be somebody who understands the finished work of the cross and understands that their sin is not more powerful than the blood of Jesus. Their sin is not more powerful than the cross. Because when that person comes in, what happens is that shame gets dismissed. We remove condemnation. And you know what happens? The dominion of sin ceases. That's why the Bible says that because we are not under the law but under grace, sin will no longer have dominion over us. The law does not have the ability to remove sin. It only has the ability to excite sin. Amen. How I many know that the, the point in which the devil could tempt Adam and Eve was, in the, was the point of God's commandment? How I many know the devil never tempted Adam and Eve not to kill each other? You know Why? Because there was no law against it. There was, no, there was nothing pointing them to the wrongness of killing each other. I mean, you know, killing each other would have accomplished the devil's plan and would have, would have messed up creation. But he couldn't tempt them with that. He had to tempt them with the point of what God told him not to do. Amen. Sin, the, the law is the strength of sin. If I tell you, don't think of a black cat. Don't think of a black cat you know, with, you know, with a, uh, a little belled necklace around his neck and with a, with a little hole in one of his ears. Don't think of a black cat like that. Don't think, I mean, as I'm telling you not to do that, I'm pointing you in the direction of that and I'm empowering you to do what I'm telling you not to do. It's the very nature of the law. The law does not have the ability to set people free from sin. It actually only has the ability to condemn. Only grace has the ability to remove the dominion of sin because it removes the oxygen of that fire and it kills the flame by the power of God's grace. So if someone's wrapped up in addiction and they're wrapped up in pornography and they're wrapped up in sin, you know what they need to hear? They need to hear God loves them. They need to hear that they're forgiven. Now how many know in the very same light we need to recognize what they're doing is wrong? We don't remove that reality. How many know grace does not take away the concepts of right and wrong? <clears throat> We're not going to meet someone who's a drug addict and they're hooked on drugs and they're smoking crack and say, ah, it's all good, man. Just smoke all the crack you want. God still loves you. 
Now, how many know it's a true statement that God still loves them? But look, man, if someone's doing something that's killing them, as, as someone who loves them, I need to point out, this is killing you. This is wrong. Amen. And that's where there can be a perversion of the message of the Gospel. Right's still right, wrong's still wrong in the places where Scripture lays that out. And so we don't tell this person, it's okay that you're doing this. But what I'm saying is this, you're better than this, and this is not who you are. Come on, let's walk together. Let's get free from this. Amen. And extend love. And what happens is we remove the strength of that sin by the power of believing in the cross. Amen? And so, we can recognize that in each other, and we can recognize that that we don't want condemnation. You don't want any condemnation in your life. Zero. None at all. We want to remove all of it. Let's turn to Romans chapter 1. And so, under the new covenant, you know, this obedience that we're called to, you're, you're, and certainly your actions are important, certainly what you do is important, but the primary call of the new covenant it's not what you're doing, it's what you're believing. God wants to get your believing right. Because when you, when you're, when you believe right, you're going to act right. And so under the new covenant, we're called to an obedience of faith. In Romans chapter 1, and in verse 5, it says, Through Him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for His name's sake. And if you, you don't have to turn there, but I'll read it to you. In Romans 16, 25 and 26, it says, Now to Him who is able to establish you according to My Gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest by the prophetic Scriptures, made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. This is what you're called to. You're called to believe. Amen? What are you called to believe? You're called to believe in Jesus. And when you believe in Jesus, you recognize that He did an amazing job on the cross and that you've been given an eternal forgiveness. Under the Old Covenant, forgiveness was based in covering sin. You ever, you ever ask your child to clean something and rather than clean the room, they shove everything under the bed? <laughs> How many of you know that's not actually clean? Right? Amen. Or, or you know, you'd be sweeping the kitchen or whatever and rather than actually sweeping, sweeping the, the stuff up, we're going to put it under the rug. I mean, oh, that's not actually clean. Under the Old Covenant, um, the blood of bulls and goats did not have the ability to clean man. Blood of bulls and goats covered sin. It could never remove it. And so there was always a remembrance of sin under the Old Covenant. It was very sin conscious. They had to make sacrifices all the time. The high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies and make a sacrifice. The people were constantly conscious of sin. Do I have sin? Do I have sin? Do I have sin? Oh, I gotta get a I gotta get a heifer and bring it in because I got sin. Oh, children of Israel, we gotta make sure the high priest goes in and makes a, an atonement for our sin. We gotta try to clean ourselves up by shoving all the sin of the nation under the bed. And how I many know man was never clean, his conscience was never sure, and he lived in a state of recognizing I'm one step away from being out of favor with God. Now, how I many know that ended two thousand years ago when Jesus died on the cross? I mean, oh, Jesus did not take all your sin and shove it under the bed. Jesus did not take your sin and shove it under a rug. I mean, oh, Jesus took all of your sin and took it into Himself. He became sin. He that knew no sin became sin. So we could become the righteousness of God. He took that sin into Himself. He condemned that sin. And then after and He spent three days in the earth, under the earth, paying the penalty for sin, and then He rose again from the dead. Why? Because all sin had been paid for, had been taken care of, had been annihilated, had been removed. There's no dirt under the bed. There's no dirt under the uh, rug. All sin has been punished in the body of Jesus Christ. It's been paid in full. Everybody say paid in full. So now, under the new covenant, you don't live a lifestyle of constantly calling your sin to remembrance. You don't live a lifestyle of constantly weighing yourself in the balances and constantly thinking about sin and have I done this, have I done that right? No, you think about Jesus. <laughs> you think about what He did for you. You recognize that you're forgiven and you live your life as a forgiven child of God, never forgetting the price that was paid for you. How I many know when you understand that it's been paid in full and you know that it was done for you, how I many know it fills your heart with gratitude? thankful 
I mean, no, we live a life that glorifies His name, not because of the fear of punishment, not because of trying to stay out of hell, not because of trying to stay in God's favor. We live a life of action that glorifies His name because we are thankful that we're saved. We're full of gratitude. A gratitude-driven life is a joyful life. When I'm living my life because I'm thankful, rather than living my life in order to try to get forgiveness, keep forgiveness, stay out of hell, all of these things. I mean, all that keeps me in a state of frazzled sin management. So, under the new covenant, we're not constantly conscious of sin. We're constantly conscious of Jesus, and we live in a state of gratitude and thanksgiving. So, what's your part to do? Just believe. Just believe in Jesus. Just believe you're forgiven. But we've had so much teaching contrary to the gospel that the vast majority of Christians live in a state of constant condemnation. The vast majority of Christians are, are getting saved every week in church. Or thinking they're one offering away from not being in God's favor. One church attendance away from not being in God's favor. So what are they doing? They live in a state of fear. You know what? They're so easy to control like that. They're so easy to make people come to church. So easy to get people to give. So easy to get people to evangelize. So easy to get people to do stuff, but they're doing stuff because they're scared of God, not because they believe God loves them. So everything that they're doing is really dead works. It's wood, hay, and stubble. If I, if, if I ask you to give me a hug, and you give me a hug because you're scared of what's going to happen if you don't give me a hug, do we have a real relationship? We don't. If you, are, if you are so scared of me that you feel like, um, and I make you spend time with me, I make you serve me, I make, you know, how I many know oh, that is a twisted, messed up relationship? But a good portion of Christianity, that's how they serve God. That's how they live with God. They're, they, they're one step away from not being forgiven. They're one step away from not having their salvation. Whew. I just hate it, man, because, because they're not like, Kids, they're like slaves. They don't get to know a loving father. They serve a taskmaster slave, slave master. And they live in fear all the days of their lives. And they live in a world that don't like them anyway. How many know if you're in this world, uh, this world's antichrist? So they live in a world that's against them, and they think God's against them. And so they shuffle into church, they give all their money, they live their entire life, and they pour their life out in the hopes that maybe God will love them and like them at the end of their days. Do you think that concept dishonors what Jesus did on the cross? Jesus does not need any help from any man to do what He did. He did it all. And He took care of sin. So you don't live your life under a fearful serving of a taskmaster who's going to force you into relationship. No, you live with the loving Father who sent His Son to die for your sins to where now you and I, we enjoy a perfect forgiveness. You're perfectly forgiven today. And I'll take it a step further. Not only are you forgiven, God says your sin and lawless deeds He remembers no more. God's not even looking at your sin any longer. Is that great news? It's the best news in the world. It's really hard to believe. It's a, ch it's a challenge. That's why it's the fight of faith. But this is your obedience. What God wants you to do? I want you to believe that you're loved and you're forgiven. That's all I'm asking. Amen. I mean, if you believe that you're loved and you're forgiven as a result of the person of Jesus Christ, how I many know oh, that's going to change the way you act? See, someone who's not condemned and knows God loves them is for, and is for them, those people are less inclined to struggle with the dominion of sin. Why? Because I know my identity. How I many you know I, my identity? I'm not a drug addict. There's a time in my life when I was a drug addict. And, and that's, that, was, that was what I did. That's who I was. But now I've got a new identity. I'm not a drug addict anymore. Sin doesn't have dominion over me anymore. And as a result of that, that absence of condemnation, that absence of oxygen keeps the flame of sin from burning in my life. Now, periodically, I'm going to make mistakes. Periodically, I'm going to mess up. Periodically, I'm going to get mad in traffic. You know what I'm saying? Periodically, I'm going to say something dumb. But you know what I'm going to be reminded of? I'm not going to go and make a sacrifice for my sin. I'm going to remember that my Savior died for me. 
And because He died for me, even though I got mad in traffic, I can sit here and thank God that I'm forgiven and that I'm a child of God and nothing can pluck me out of my Father's hand. Do you see how that's going to produce a life of gratitude and gratefulness as I don't live under that horrible banner of condemnation? But as I live under that, as I speak that, as I live that, I will be persecuted by everything that moves. (laughs) And especially from Christians. Because they don't understand the new covenant. And they think that you're giving people a license to sin. When in reality, you're only honoring the work of the cross. I believe Jesus did a good job. And as a result of that, I'm going to be forgiven all the days of my life. Sin will never be imputed to me or you. According to the gospel, that's the truth. Sin won't be imputed to you. Now, I'm not saying there aren't repercussions for bad decisions. Can I get an amen? You do something dumb, you're going to get dumb results. But the dumb results don't come from God. They come from yourself. God will actually rescue, from, rescue you from your dumb results because He loves you so much. But your obedience is the obedience of faith. That's what you're called to do. Just simply believe this simple truth. It's the number one thing. In 1 John chapter 3 and in verse 23 it says, And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave His commandment. This is the whole part of the new covenant. This is our commandment, to simply believe. Amen? So and 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 so let's believe it. Amen. Let's believe we're the righteousness of God. Now we got to say it. And we're going to look at that here in just a moment. You got to speak this out of your mouth. Um, you got to this is how you take up how many we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. We you got to overcome the accuser. The accuser's coming. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. While you're on earth, the accuser will try to accuse you. And his primary thing is to get you to accuse yourself. Turn to 1 John chapter 3, please. And, what he, and so we have to, and we've been looking at what condemnation is, we've been looking at, at what it is, but we've not actually looked at how we attack it. And we're going to, but first we need to take a look at this Scripture first before we take a look at how we attack it. Um, 1 John chapter 3, and in verse 20, it says, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. So now, I teach on this all the time because it's really important. And uh, this is an important thing to understand about yourself is this. Your heart, your heart personally, has the ability to condemn you when God is not condemning you. Okay? Let's look at it again. For if our heart condemn us, If I'm entertaining condemnation, if I've allowed the accuser to convince me the cross was not enough, if I've allowed the accuser to get my attention on my failure and get me to focus on the places where I've fallen short and get me to start to doubt the work of the cross and doubt what Jesus did, if my heart condemns me, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. So, How many know that God does not want your heart to condemn you? Now, let let, let me lay it out to you like this. How many know that Peter denied the Lord three times? Okay, He lived with Him. He walked with Him. He ate with Him. He saw the miracles. He believed in Him enough to leave everything and come follow Him. Okay, And Peter would make statements like, Lord, you know, I will die with you. He, would make, he said, if everybody else leaves you, I will never leave you. Right? And so he made these statements of, of confidence in Jesus, and he boasted in his faith in Jesus. But how many know there came a time when at the Garden of Gethsemane, when it all hit the fan and everything broke loose, that, that Peter publicly denied Jesus three different times. And the Bible says the last time he did it was swearing. And so... What I want to show you, and then the Bible, and Jesus told him that it was going to happen. He told him, how many know God will prepare you for your failure so He can rescue you after you've fallen? He'll do it. He did it in Peter. He said, look, you're going to, when, it, when it all goes down, you're going to deny me three times. Peter didn't believe Him. But then the Bible says that after he made that third denial of Jesus, the cock crowed, And Jesus turned and looked at him. So evidently, the last time he denied him, he was within, visibly could see Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus turned around and looked at him. 
And then he says he wept bitterly. What happened to him? He got condemned. He, everything that he said that he was never going to do, he did. And everything that he said he wasn't going, wasn't going to do, he did. He failed as big as a human being can fail. After spending three and a half years with Jesus. And so here comes condemnation. How many know when he wept bitterly, how many know he, he, he was destroyed? And then afterwards, you know, when Jesus goes to the cross, how many know Peter don't go? Why? Condemnation zone in Peter. Peter's not going to the cross. Peter feels like he's let Jesus down. He's let God down. Now God Almighty is against him. He's under condemnation. Now, how many know that it's going to be difficult for him to be the leader of the New Testament church and live under condemnation? How many know it's going to be difficult for you to be a leader anywhere and live under condemnation? How many know it's difficult for you to lead your kids when you're under condemnation? It's difficult for a husband to be the head of the house when he's under condemnation. It's difficult for anyone to do anything with any confidence when they feel condemned. And so Jesus goes to Peter, makes breakfast for him. This is after Jesus is raised from the dead. Makes breakfast for him, sits down with him, and has a personal ministry session with Jesus. What is he doing with Jesus? He's taking that barb of condemnation that's been rooted into his heart, and he's removing it. He wants Peter to know, listen, I know you failed, I know you've fallen, but I love you, I'm with you, and I am for you. And how many know Jesus removed that root of condemnation out of Peter's heart? So much so that when the Holy Spirit would fall on the day of Pentecost, Jesus, Peter would get up and preach Jesus. And preach some bold stuff. Say, y'all have denied the Lord. I mean, he just did. <laughs> but he gets up and said, y'all denied the Lord, y'all sold out the Christ and all this. What, what happening? He's not living out of a state of condemnation. He's living out of a state of forgiveness. Now, we know Peter messed up. How many know Judas messed up? How many know he messed up too? But, how I many know Judas never received forgiveness? Ju Judas chose to pay for his own sin. How I many know he killed himself? Condemnation owned him, ruled him, destroyed him. But I don't think, and certainly what Judas did was bad, but how I many know what Peter did was bad too? What's the difference between the two? One tried to pay for his own sin, and one received forgiveness. Do you think Judas' sins were paid for on the cross? I'd have to think that they were. I'd have to think that all sin was paid for on the cross if Scripture is correct. Judas' sins were paid for. Judas did not believe and receive. Jesus cho Judas chose to pay the price of his own sin. How I many you know in all of our lives, we have a choice? Anybody ever have a moment where you feel like Peter? Where you've fallen and failed so much? How I many you know you've got a choice on what you're going to do? You can go the Judas route and try to pay for your own sin, or you can allow Jesus to minister to your heart and remove that root of condemnation out of your life and restore you back to a position of influence. And it's simply a result of believing. Can I get an amen? And so, Peter had a time when his heart condemned him. For all of us, how many know you can have a time when you feel like God's against you? Anybody ever experienced that? It stinks, doesn't it? <laughs> it's awful. It's a lie. It's a flat out lie. This is the fight of faith. But when your own heart is condemning you, how many know you do not have faith towards God? So, so there you are, your heart's condemning you, and you're entertaining condemnation, and what's happening is you're committing New Testament disobedience. You're not obeying the gospel because you don't believe that Jesus took care of your sin. I'm not trying to heap condemnation on you, just letting you know what's, what's happening. And then there you are, and then you got a problem come up. Sickness in your body, or, or uh, uh, fighting amongst a family member, or you got a bill that you need paid, or whatever. And there you are, and you need God to show up. But, in the back of your mind, the enemy has got that old record playing. God's not going to show up for you. Because you did this, and you said that, and you didn't do this, and you didn't do that. And so here, that old record of condemnation is playing, 
You know what it'll do? It'll rob you of confidence towards God. And rather than running to God to fix this problem, you try to fix it yourself. And then when it messes up, the enemy will take that evidence and put it right there on the case of God's against you. And then when that messes up, and so what he does, he's always trying to compile evidence of why you're not blessed. Of why you're not happy. And at the end of that line is this, God's not for you. You're not forgiven, God's against you. What is he trying to do? He's trying to get you to run away from God. Just like Adam and Eve ran away from God when they fell in the garden. How many of you know God never ran away from Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve ran away from Him. He went out, searched them out, and found them, made close to them, and loved them. Today we have the same battle. Listen, don't run from God. Run to God. Believe the truth of the Gospel. Don't allow your heart to condemn you when God is not condemning you. And recognize you may have fallen short, you may have made a mistake, but whatever you're facing, listen to me, God's for you. He's for you. Amen. And, and, and here's the thing. How I many you know sometimes He'll bring a miracle in and fix the problem? And then it's like, man, that's right. God loves me. And then how I many you know sometimes the circumstances don't fix, but something inside of you fixes? Amen. How I many know there's both types of deliverance? But at the end of the day, the bottom line is this. God's for you. And whatever you're facing, He's on your team in it. So, when, when you don't see the promise come to pass, and you see that passage of time, don't let the enemy condemn you. Can I get an amen? You're forgiven. You're loved. God is for you. That's your fight of faith. Now, turn to Isaiah, and we'll close right here. And we'll talk. And like I said, we've been talking about what condemnation is. We've been laying it out. But I want to talk about, in this, in the, in this last time here that we have, I want to talk about how we attack condemnation and how we fight back. Because um, this is not a passive thing. This is an active thing. Um, there, how many know the Bible says that we are, la- we are to labor to enter into the rest? Right? And so, how many know we're supposed to, when you're truly trusting someone, you're at rest? Do you have someone in your life you can trust? Thank God for those people. Like, you can trust. Like, I mean, you've got some people in your life you can kind of trust. But then you've got some people that you know if you ask them to do something or you say something, you know that you can trust them. How many know those people bring you rest? Because you know they got it. And when you are, and I was talking about this during worship, when you are trusting God with something, you're at rest. But when you're not at rest is when you're not trusting God with it and you take it from God and you're going to fix it. How many know we make horrible gods? We're not good at it. <clears throat> and when I try to be God of my own life, <clears throat> I get stressed out and wigged out. And if I live in that state, instead of living in a state of rest, I'm white-knuckling the steering wheel of my life, and I'm freaked out the whole time, living in a state of fear, trying to fix stuff, not trusting anybody, not trusting God, not trusting myself, and I'm miserable. And I mean, oh, God wants to teach you how to, to trust Him and rest. Amen. So that you don't have to live wigged out. But it says that we labor to enter into that rest. So I want to talk about that labor a little bit because condemnation is not going away because you pretend like it's not there. Condemnation does not go away because you make a decision to watch a movie. Condemnation does not go away because we, have, we, we intend to ignore it and act like it's not there. I mean, no condemnation can make you eat. Yeah. It's going to be honest. Come on now. I mean, no, you can get you feel condemned and feel bad and just eat, try to eat your way into a state of freedom. Amen. It's true. How many know people do it with sleep? Try to sleep myself into a place of freedom. Sleep myself into. How many know people can OD on sleep? Depression will always lead you to sleep all the time. How many of people can OD on food? People can OD on alcohol. People can OD on sex. People can OD on buying stuff. Materialism. How many of you know none of those things have the ability to remove that root of condemnation out of your life? 
All it does is it postpones addressing the issue. And so what is it that we actually, how do we, because this is the fight of faith. How many of you are called to fight a fight of faith? There's a fight. There's a battle here. Amen. And, th- and this, this, is, this is what we do. This is our end. Because here's the, here's the amazing reality. The work was finished 2,000 years ago. Like, it's finished. But my part is to believe. And there are things that I can do to help my, help my believing. Number one is I hear. Number one is you do what you're doing right now. You just hear the gospel. Just hear. See, because you're never going to arrive to a place where you're so solid in this that you don't need to hear it anymore. That's a, that's a huge truth right there. I mean, you know that I, I, I've been married for 18 years and I probably need to tell my wife that I love her more than once. Right? I mean, I love her. I, love, I, meant, I meant it when I said it. 18 years ago. Hey Amen. I mean, that's not going to fly well. I mean, she needs a regular I love you. Can I get an amen? So that she can be confident in an already present love. How I many know I need an, a regular I love you? We all need a regular I love you. Even though God's already made it clear to you that He loves you, how I many I need to hear it again? Why? Because you live in a world that don't like you at all. And so you need a regular I love you from God. That's what the gospel is. It's an, and so no matter what's preached, I don't care if we're preaching on prayer we're preaching on giving. We're preaching on evangelism. We're preaching on, 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 your, on the Spirit of God. The I love you should be intertwined in the message. Because if it's not, I can heap a bunch of wisdom on you and then you feel condemned because you're not doing any of it. And that's why the Gospel must be intertwined. In, Jesus must be intertwined in everything that we do. Because you need to hear an I love you even in the midst of correction. Even in the midst of God giving you wisdom and information. Because one I love you is not going to do it. So, so even though my, our love is, my love for my wife's the same, she needs to hear it regularly, and I need to hear it regularly, and you need to hear, and I love you from God regularly. This is the fight of faith. This is why we got to keep hearing the good news of the gospel so that we can believe it. I like what Martin Luther said. He said, if I did not preach this every day, I'd forget it. That's what he said. He didn't have iPod and all that kind of stuff that we have today. I mean, we can hear God. We can hear it anytime we want now. But we live in a world of so much distraction, it's easy to not hear it. It's easy to live our life eating only Twinkies, you know what I'm saying? Entertainment. And not actually feeding on the bread of life, which is Jesus. Amen. So, Isaiah 54, this is, this is how we, this is one of the ways, and we're going to look at a lot of different ways. You know what, let me just say this real quick. You know one of the ways you attack a condemnation? Communion. Communion is a declaration of your innocence every single time you take it. I love it, man. It's so good. We will eventually look into that. Isaiah 54, it says in verse 14, In righteousness you shall be established. Okay, God, the new covenant is all about you and me being established that we are the righteousness of God. Okay, How many know under the old covenant your righteousness was an action? Under the new covenant, your righteousness is a person. Okay? Jesus is now your righteousness. Is that not the best news in the world? Jesus is your righteousness. You can embrace Him because now you are a part of Him. You are inside of Him. He is inside of you. He is now your righteousness. And you know what that means? How many know the devil has no accusation he can bring against Jesus? He has nothing that will stand in a court of law the, the law of the universe against Jesus Christ. Do you know that the same innocence that Jesus enjoys has been given to you as a gift? There's no accusation that can stand against you. Why? Because your conduct is not being weighed in the balances. Your Savior is, has, has been weighed in the balances and He's been found perfect. How many of y'all, your lamb is perfect. The sacrifice for your sin, perfect. Amen. So now... Now, what you're called to do is get established in this reality. I mean, you know, we're not called into the new covenant to take my filthy rags of righteousness and bring it to the priest and say, look at my filthy... How I many you know that our righteousness is as filthy rags? What is self-righteousness? It's your conduct. Everybody in here, your conduct is not good enough. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. 
Your conduct will never be good enough. Now, I'm not saying love can't flow through you more. I'm not saying the fruit of the Spirit can't flow you more, through you more. I'm not saying grace can't uh, um, uh, stop the dominion of sin in your life. I'm not saying that there can't be change and maturity and growth in our lives. But at the end of the day, folks, uh, we are not our own Savior. His strength is made perfect in your weakness. You need a Savior. I need a Savior. And we need Him 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Amen? I mean, there's nobody in this room any better than anybody else. We all need Jesus. And that brings a humility and a gratitude into our lives. But this righteousness that you've been given, how many of we got to get established in the fact that our filthy rags of righteousness, self-righteousness, does not define us? We've got to get it established into our lives that Jesus has become our righteousness. How confident would you be if you walked through your, through your Monday tomorrow and Jesus stood with you the whole day? Jesus Christ stood right next to you. All day at work, all day at school or whatever you had going on, every meal that you were, Jesus was right there with you. You could see Him, you could touch Him, you could feel Him. I mean, no, you would have, no one could intimidate you. No boss, no person would have the ability to make you feel less than yourself. Why? Because the Son of God is standing with you. Amen. See, that's what the disciples enjoyed for three and a half years. All hell broke loose. Here's Jesus coming against the entire Jewish Judeo, Judaism culture of the day. And, but everywhere they went, they had confidence. Why? We got the Son of God. We got Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus, but Jesus told him, it's expedient for you that I go because I'm going to send another. And he's going to convict you of righteousness. See, they had no need to be convicted of righteousness when Jesus walked with them because Jesus was with them. But now the Spirit of God needs to convince you that the same Jesus that walked with the disciples is not actually living inside of you. So as you go through your day tomorrow, your righteousness is in you and he's a person and he's never going to leave you and he's never going to forsake you. You know what that means? It means you're eternally blessed. Nothing can curse you. Nothing can come against you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. The only thing that can happen is if my heart disagrees with the Christ in me and my heart condemns me, then I believe the lie that God's not for me. And how many know if you believe that lie, you're not going to enjoy the reality of it? You know, and, and I bring out just the, the simple fact, you know, you go to a two-year-old child and you take their nose, and it's traumatic. <laughs> you know, I've seen kids get really mad. I mean, I forget where I was at with a cousin or something like that, but someone threw the nose out the window. And man, you, I mean, screaming bloody murder, my nose, you know, just completely like freaked out. And it can show them a mirror. No, you still have your nose. You are fine, you know. But the, <laughs> amen. But how I many know you never take that child's nose? But how I many know if they believe that they've lost their nose, they're not going to be happy and they're not going to have peace and they're going to be very afraid and very angry. Just as sure as no one can take that child's nose, no one can take your Jesus from you. No one can take your righteousness. You can't take your righteousness. No one else can take your righteousness. Your righteousness is more, really and truly more solid than all of creation. How I many you know the heavens will pass away? The earth will pass away. Everything's going to pass away. You know what's not going to pass away? Jesus. And the righteousness that He's given you is given. It's more solid than the chair you're sitting on. Amen? But how many know we can... Now today, if I come out to one of you guys and I try to take your nose, how many know nobody's going to freak out? Because you've learned no one can take your nose. What if the day happened when we matured and got skilled in righteousness to we actually believed that no one could take our righteousness from us? That's the only way you mature as a Christian. Passage of time does not bring maturity. You know how you mature? You get skilled in righteousness. You recognize you're the righteousness of God. As long as the enemy can condemn you out of your relationship with God, as long as the enemy can bring doubt and fear into our hearts concerning how our Father feels about us, we're not quite yet established in righteousness. Did y'all see that? Do we see where now it becomes something that's kind of important? I need to understand. I need to forget a lot of the things that I've learned in the past and I need to embrace Jesus as my righteousness and be confident that He's my Savior. Amen? Because what happens if we do that is the next verse. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression. 
for you shall not fear. And from terror, it shall not come near you. What happens? As I get established in righteousness, it causes me to be fearless. It causes me to not be afraid. It causes oppression to have no place in my life. I mean, you know, that would be nice <laughs> to have that. And that, that comes from hearing the Gospel, renewing our minds, putting our faith in Jesus, all the things that we're doing right now. But then as we go down into the rest of this passage of Scripture, we start seeing the aggressive aspect of attacking condemnation. But I, in my opinion, and you know, anytime I speak about something that's not scripturally based, <clears throat> you always have to throw it out there with a grain of salt. It's not scripture, then then uh, you know I I you know I throw it with a grain of salt. But historically speaking, the Apostle John, um, according to church history and Josephus and all of that, I feel like he kind of arrived to this place because they were unable to kill him. They were unable to martyr him. They tried to roll him down the hill in in a, in a barrel filled with knives. They tried to boil him in hot oil, according to church history. And eventually they just banished him to the Isle of Patmos because they could not, they could not get, they couldn't kill this guy. And on the Isle of Patmos, of course, he has the revelation, the, the book of Revelation comes in, he has an encounter with God. I feel like that John got so established in the love of God, so established in the righteousness of God, that he became a man that was fearless. He became a man that was unafraid to march all the way to the cross when all the other disciples left. He became a man that was ready to take care of Jesus' mother when everybody else left. Why? I feel like he got to that place where this became, he got established in righteousness. So I say this to, because this is something that, that we can do. I mean, I, I, we don't want depression to be a part of our life. Can I get an amen? I mean, no, we don't want addiction to sin to be a part of our life. We don't want any of that junk I mean, no, we want healthy relationships. We want healthy bodies. We want healthy finances. We want, we want the blessing of the Lord. Well, we can't spend our days addressing the peripheral problems. We're going to have to go to the root of this condemnation and get it removed out of our life and to stay out of our life. We're going to have to get established in righteousness by allowing Jesus to be our righteousness and not we ourselves. I mean, on Romans 10, the Bible says that they went about trying to establish their own righteousness. And they were ignorant of the Lord's righteousness. I mean, a good portion of the church think that their standing with God is based on their conduct. Your standing with God does not have anything to do with your conduct. It has everything to do with your Savior. I'm not saying your conduct doesn't matter. I'm not saying that your conduct isn't important. I mean, if I believe that I'm a good person, I'm going to act like a good person. If I believe that I'm righteous, I'm going to act righteous. God goes past the peripherals of our conduct, and goes to our heart and says, if I can get you to believe right, I'll get you to act right. And really, he just says, I want you to awake to righteousness. Now, let's, and we're going to close right here. Let's drop down. And let's go to uh, verse 17. It says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is, this is, this is, where, this is where the fight of faith comes. This is where your action comes. This is where you labor to enter into the rest. You cannot tolerate any tongue of judgment to rise against you. You can't give place to it. Okay? And here's the thing. I'd say 99% of, your, of the tongues of judgment that arise against you come from you. So it'd be great if we could just have a third party that would just condemn us. You know, talking about like a, the enemy condemning you, the accuser coming to condemn you. I'm the devil, you're bad, you're horrible, you're awful. We could be like, no, nope, I condemn that tongue of judgment. No problem there. <laughs> but how many does it happen like that? <laughs> Too easy, right? What does the enemy want to do? He wants to, for you to condemn you. First person. Tell me, what Paul made this statement. He said, I don't even judge my own self. How I many of you have lost the right to judge yourself? You don't have the right anymore. You forsook that. 
God is your judge. Amen. And how many know that He judges you in righteousness? He judges you in Jesus. You've been judged right. You've been judged not guilty. You don't have the right to judge yourself any longer. Somebody died for you. Amen. They paid for your sin. You can't judge yourself any longer. The blood testifies against your accusation of yourself. <laughs> the blood testifies. Speaks better things than the blood of Abel. That you're forgiven. And so, when these tongues of judgment arise out of your mind, and out of your internal thought processes, and you start acting as though you're condemned, and you're not good enough, and you're not spiritual enough, and you're just a bad person, and you're just a liar, you're just an angry person, you're just a jealous person, all that, all those are lies. And you're going to have to say out of your mouth what God said about you. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. I am forgiven. I'm the righteousness of God. I condemn any tongue of judgment that tries to rise against me. Why? The rest of the verse. This is the heritage. It's your inheritance of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is is from me, says the Lord. Here's this beautiful Old Testament prophecy saying, I am sending one that will testify for you, and I'm giving one that will become your righteousness, and you'll have to stand upon the cornerstone of the finished work of the cross, and you, out of your mouth, will have to condemn every tongue of judgment that rises against you. So, when your behavior witnesses to the fact that you're not right with God, I mean, no, oh, you've got to, out of your mouth, declare you're the righteousness of God. What are you talking about, Jeremiah? Let me give you an example. Let's say you're in traffic. Let's say you get super mad in traffic. Have choice words to say. Okay? Now, is that right? No, it's not. I mean, oh, it's not right to live in anger. It's wrong. You don't want to do that. I mean, no, oh, that's not a good witness. Amen. But, that thing that's not right, and that failure that you entertained, how I many know it's not greater than your Savior? Okay, get an amen. And so what do you got to say? Don't take that filthy rag of your own righteousness and wrap it around your face as grave clothes on Lazarus' stinking body. <laughs> take the garment of your salvation. Take the righteousness that's been given to you as a gift. The robe of righteousness has been placed on your shoulders and you say out of your mouth what the Father would love for the prodigal son to have said. I am a son of God. I am not a servant. I'm here because I belong here. Amen. How many know this is your inheritance? This is your heritage. So when you sin, when you fail, when you fall short, you know what it's time to do? It's time for you to confess that you're the righteousness of God. Amen. Quite, quite different than uh, what we're taught when we mix old and new. Very different. Now listen, how I many know oh, you may have to apologize to somebody? Can I get an amen? How I many know oh, you, you, you might how I many you know there's time to tell God you're sorry? It's time to talk to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I missed that. But how I many know that, that, that your forgiveness is based on the work of the cross? Your forgiveness is not based on your ability to confess every failure that you've made. We're going to look at that next week. 1 John 1 9. If you think that your forgiveness, your salvation is based on your ability to confess all your sin, you better stay home and just confess sin for the rest of your life. And then you're still not going to, you're not going, you're not going to make it all. That's not what 1 John 1.9 is talking about. And I know that may, some people watching or some people here, that may disrupt your thought process a little bit. And I understand that's what I was taught too. But if you have to confess all of your sin in order to be forgiven, you better not miss one. How many know whatsoever is not of faith is sin? Every time you're afraid, every time you're worried, how many know that's sin? And if you miss one, how many know you're no longer saved? How many know that's a rough life? If I have to confess everything that I've done wrong in order to maintain my salvation, it sounds like I'm saving me more than Jesus is. What ends up happening is my salvation becomes upon my shoulders, and you know what? I don't have any time for a relationship with God. I don't have any time for a relationship with people. I'm just going to sit in the corner like a madman and confess sin, hoping that I get all of them. 1 John 1.9 was not written 
to saved people. It was written to people who were dealing with something in the church at the early church called Gnosticism. When they're saying there's no such thing as sin. We'll take a look at it. We'll open it up. And we'll look at it in Scripture. Because if you look at 1 John 1.9, 1, in the beginning it's addressing something that was plaguing the church. And then it ends up revealing the righteousness that was given to you as a gift. And, and I say all that to say this. You need to confess your righteousness when you fail. How I many you know if you're experiencing sickness in your body, what do we confess? Healing. Right? If we're, if we're experiencing financial lack, what do we confess? God supplies all my needs. How I many you know when we sin and fall short, you need to confess who you are in Christ so you don't stay there. So what the enemy wants to do is he wants your failure to become a garment that you wear. Let's, say, let's look at it like this. Let's say I'm in traffic and I get mad and I cuss somebody out in traffic. Then I go to the department store and they won't take my return. And so I cuss somebody out in the department store. And then I'm super mad. Now I feel like God's mad at me. So now I'm carrying all this condemnation and I bring it home for my family to enjoy. <laughs> because I feel so bad about myself and what I've done. Now I'm, I'm yelling at them. And then here comes, here comes the accusation of the enemy in first person. Look at you, you're just an angry person. You have a problem with anger. You're an angry person. Now, I have a couple options here. I can believe in the cross. I can believe that Jesus did a good job and I'm a new creation in Christ. Or I can take that false reality of that I'm an angry person and I can put it on. And I can say it out of my mouth and I can become a lie. I can not identify with my Savior and I can identify with my failure and I will simply reinforce fallen behavior. I'm just an angry person. I'm just an angry person. I'm just an angry person. How many know the more I say it, the more I act it, the more I establish its reality, but the entire time I'm actually lying against the truth. Because God did not make anyone an angry person. Your nature is love, peace, joy, kindness. How I many know instead, and so now let's just go back to where I cuss someone out in traffic. And instead of me embracing my failure and it becoming my identity, what if instead I say, Lord, I thank you. I'm the righteousness of God. And I am so grateful that you paid for my sin. Thank you for that, Lord. Now, my heart is filled with gratitude. And when I go into the department store, I'm not carrying the anger of my failure. I'm carrying the gratitude of my Savior. And as I stand before that person who wrongs me, rather than me reacting in anger, I'm so thankful that I'm saved. I'm so thankful I'm the righteousness of God. I give them a love and a graciousness that they don't deserve because I'm receiving something I didn't reserve. Do you see where it stops the domino effect of sin? But if I take on that failure and I embrace it and I condemn myself and then I put myself under more law and more legalism and more condemnation, sin gets stronger and more rampant and I get madder and madder and madder and madder and I get so mad that I don't want anything to do with God. And I just walk away from God because God don't want me anyway. Why would He want somebody like me? Look at me. And I walk away from the kindness and love of my Savior. And the whole time I'm forgiven. The whole time I'm loved. The whole time I've taken on a false identity. How I many of the Bible says to awake to righteousness and sin not? We're to wake up to who we are. Amen? And so, this, um, this passage, we condemn the tongues of judgment that arise against us. We speak out of our mouths. Don't tolerate condemnation. How I many you know you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't tolerate dog poo on your shoe, right? You get dog poo on your shoe, it's time to do something about that, right? I mean, you know, you don't, you, don't, you don't tolerate that, right? You remove it. Why? Because it smells bad. I mean, you know, that condemnation is the same way. I mean, you know, just as sure as you won't tolerate dog poo on your shoe, I mean, you know, you don't, want to, you don't want to tolerate condemnation in your marriage, in your family, in your finances. Anywhere you are, we don't want to tolerate it. What do we want to do? We want to address it. How do we address it? We speak. We say what God has said about us. And you keep speaking and you keep speaking and you keep condemning the tongues of judgment that arise against you. And you recognize. And what you want to do is you want your heart not to condemn you. You want your heart to be in agreement with the cross so that you know that God is for you and God loves you. Can I get an amen? And then what happens is we start to get, our, we start to get established in righteousness. Condemnation ceases to have a place in our life and the fruit on our tree starts to change. 
And we're not actually addressing the anger. We're not addressing uh, the addiction. We're not addressing the sickness. We're not addressing the financial lack. We're not addressing the messed up relationships. We're addressing the root. We're addressing the primary root, which is condemnation. Which is the obedience of faith, which is what we're called to do. Amen? So, let's stay aggressive against condemnation. Let's continue to attack it. Let's learn about it. And let's not tolerate it in our lives because it contaminates everything else. Amen. Father, we just thank You and praise You for the ability to hear Your voice, Lord, to honor the work of the cross. And, and Lord, we just thank You that we live lives free from condemnation. We don't tolerate it, Lord. And Lord, I just lift up all those that are traveling over this holiday season. Lord, they're out of town. And Lord, I just speak a blessing over them. I thank You for Your hand upon their lives. Thank You for Your grace upon their lives, Lord God, that Your Spirit would be upon all of us, Lord, as we enter into our week, that we'd live days of no condemnation, days of heaven on earth, Lord. We thank You for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are going to decorate the tree.